2023 was a year full of incredible archaeological discoveries, ranging from unbelievably well-preserved artifacts to sites that could change the way we think about the deep human past. So join me as we count down 10 of the best and most interesting finds as voted on by you, the viewers. As a bonus, I've also included three discoveries at the end that I personally think are incredible, but are also very important for the future of archaeology. So let's get started. Number one on the list is a literal archaeological treasure map. It is the Saint Velac Slab. First discovered in 1900 by Paul de Châtelet inside a prehistoric burial chamber in Finisterre, France, the slab was recognized at first to be strange, but they were unsure what it was. It was then taken back to Paul's home at Château de Cernu and put into storage where it stayed for 114 years. In 2014, the slab was rediscovered and archaeologists and historians have been poring over it ever since. The 1.5 by 1.9 meter slab is made from local grey schist, which is a type of rock that forms in layers that can be easily separated and is engraved with geometric shapes such as circles, squares, lines, and concave and convex impressions. In 2021, researchers declared that these symbols and impressions actually represented settlements, barrows which are ancient burial mounds and farming fields, and declared the St. Belak slab to be Europe's oldest map at over 4,000 years old. While this was an incredible discovery, there was just one problem. According to the 2021 researchers, the map depicts an area of 30 by 21 kilometers, and according to their estimations, it could take over 15 years to find exactly where this represents. 15 years is a long time, but luckily for us, a new excavation of the area in 2023 identified additional pieces of the map. Researchers were able to combine the new and old pieces to create a scan that could be compared with current maps. What they found was an 80% match to a region 500 kilometers west of Paris, which formed part of the Brittany region. The new pieces of the map also helped researchers identify different symbols on the map, which included animal enclosures, plot systems, roads, and additional bearings. Mounds. If the area can be identified, then the map may lead to hundreds of previously undiscovered dwellings and burial mounds, with the possibility of containing more maps like the St. Belak slab. It's not every day archaeologists get to follow a literal ancient treasure map to discover new sites, and that's why I've included it here because this is quite literally a once in a lifetime discovery that could transform what we know about the history of Brittany. Number two on our list is the first ever depiction of a Tartessos person. 2,500 years ago, a civilization known as Tartessos vanished off the face of the earth, and for the first time ever, we now know what they look like. The story based on the archaeological evidence goes that in the final days of their civilization, hundreds of Tartesians gathered inside a hall around a long wooden table stacked with food, wine, and precious gifts. While the people feasted and celebrated, an unsettling ritual unfolded outside. Animals, horses, pigs, cows, donkeys, dogs, and possibly even humans were sacrificed as an offering to an unknown god. Stepping through the blood of their victims and over their still warm bodies, the people then took torches and burnt everything to the ground, peeling the adobes from the walls and scorching the flesh of the sacrificial victims. In the bloody scorched aftermath, they worked relentlessly to bury the entire site under a thick layer of dirt and clay measuring 4.2 meters deep. And then, after this colossal effort, the Tartesians vanished without a trace, leaving behind an enduring mystery that lingered through the ages. At least that's how the story goes anyway, and while some of the details about this final feast of the Tartesians are up for debate, the archaeological evidence for the burning down of the site, the banquet, the sacrifices, and the subsequent burying of it all holds true. But that's about it. We know very little else about the Tartessos civilization. We know that their empire thrived between 1000 and 500 BCE in a location that Herodotus described as beyond the Pillars of Hercules. These are two large cliffs that flank the entrance to the Strait of Gibraltar, which places the Tartessos civilization in modern-day southwest Spain. We know that they were an extremely wealthy society because in 500 BCE, Ephros, who was another Greek historian, describes a very prosperous market called Tartessos. In this market, tin can be carried by river as well as gold and copper from the Celtic lands. Thanks to Herodotus and Ephoros, we also know that they were a technologically advanced society, having invented the first Western European writing based on the Phoenician system, and developing advanced mortar techniques that were previously thought to have been invented by the Romans. As for their capital city, we know it was called Carpia, but it disappeared in 600 BCE. Because of this timeline and descriptions of Carpia as a great harbour city, there has even been speculation that Carpia is the lost city of Atlantis. But who were these people? 
Some people think that the Tartesians were people indigenous to the region who mixed with Greek and Phoenicians, but not a single depiction of a Tartesian person has ever been found. In fact, the archaeologists were almost certain that the Tartesians were an aniconic culture, which means that they represented divinity through animal and plant motifs and specifically did not depict the human form. At least that's what they thought until now. The images you're looking at now are the first ever depictions of a human form by the Tartesian culture we have ever found. If you're listening to this on the podcast, I highly recommend you Google this. You are one of the first people to see what they looked like in over 2,000 years. It's believed that both figures are female, and archaeologists suggest that this may mean that they're representations of gods. Incredibly, these busts are detailed enough that researchers can even see that jewellery and hairstyles are similar to those found in the ancient Middle East and Asia, indicating a cultural exchange or possible heritage of the Tartesian people. This is such an important find because it changes how we think about the Tartesians from being a society that does not depict the human body to a culture that does, and that means that now, if we go looking for them, we will find them, and that in turn might tell us more about this incredibly interesting and enigmatic culture. Number three takes us over to the Levant, where four exceptionally well-preserved Roman swords and the head of a javelin have been found in a cave overlooking the Dead Sea. The iron blades measure 60 to 65 centimeters or 24 to 26 inches long, and all four of these 1900-year-old swords are in incredible condition on account of having been stored in wooden sheaths. In fact, the exposed tips look as though they could even still be quite dangerous. The cave was actually already known to archaeologists because it contains a stalactite with an ink inscription written on it that it dates to around 900 BCE. It was when the archaeologists went back to the cave to photograph the inscription that they found these weapons hidden in a deep narrow crack in the rock. They also found ornate handles made of wood and metal and leather strips laying nearby, possibly the remnants of sandals according to one member of the team. But what exactly are these weapons doing hiding in this cave? The swords date to a period from 132 to 135 CE called the Bar Kochpa Revolt. This was a Jewish rebellion against the Roman rule of Judea, and these swords were most likely stashed here by Jewish rebels to be used in a future rebellion. It would have been a lot safer to stash them here, because being caught with Roman weapons would have been really bad. The fact that the swords are still in the cave doesn't bode well for whoever stashed them, however, but it does make for an unbelievable discovery. What's more is that after finding the swords and realizing the potential significance of the cave, the team started to excavate and found artifacts from the Charcolith period, which is the transitionary period between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, which dates back to 6,000 years ago. Possibly the most exciting part about this discovery is that the cave survey program which identified this cave started in 2017 and has already discovered at least 20 new caves, and in 2021, one of those caves contained a previously undiscovered fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls called the Book of the Twelve Minor Prophets. 20 new caves sounds pretty impressive, but for context, there are actually more than 2,000 caves in this region that have been identified and are just waiting to be explored. So you can bet we'll be finding a ton more archaeology in this region. Number four is the first ever decipherment of a Herculaneum scroll. The charred scrolls of Herculaneum are one of the most iconic and inaccessible sources of historic literature. The scrolls were burned and carbonized when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE, and for 2,000 years, the ancient knowledge held by the scrolls has been completely inaccessible. But now, thanks to machine learning, that's all about to change. The scrolls were first discovered in 1750, when workers digging a tunnel began to discover large pieces of what they first thought were charcoal. When they took a closer look, they realized that what they were looking at were carbonized scrolls. They had discovered an ancient Roman mansion that would come to be known as the Villa of the Papyri and originally belonged to the father-in-law of Julius Caesar. Over the next two years, the workers removed over 1,000 scrolls, many of which have since been destroyed by attempts to open them. At the Vesuvius Challenge, which was launched in March of 2023, challenged computer scientists and programmers to use machine learning in order to find a way to read the scrolls without damaging them, offering up to $1 million to someone who could solve the problem. Now, Luke Farriter, a 21-year-old computer science student, has become the first person in 2,000 years to read one of the scrolls. Although Luke only revealed a single word, this word represents an enormous leap forward in the decoding of these ancient texts. In order to achieve this mind-blowing accomplishment, the scrolls were first imaged using a particle accelerator, which was able to generate 3D scans down to as small as just 4 microns, that's 0.004 millimeters or 0.0001 of an inch. 
The team also scanned some broken fragments that were known to have visible ink on them in order to be able to identify and detect what the ink actually looks like. Looking at these images, Casey Handman noticed a piece of scroll that had a crackle left on it where ink had been applied. Luke Farriter then heard about this from a podcast, joined the Discord, learned about the crackle pattern and began training a machine learning model to identify that exact pattern. Before long, it found its first match, and with every discovery, the model got better and better until it was identifying ink that even Luke couldn't see with his bare eyes. Shortly after that, Luke had found what he believed were 16 letters, and when the image was shown to a team of perperologists, they audibly gasped, declaring that it clearly read porphyros, quite a rare ancient Greek word for purple. While this incredible discovery was being made, another student named Yusuf Nadar was working on an alternative approach that aimed to detect the ink on the papyrus without relying on the crackles that Luke's model had detected. Although Yusuf's submission came after Luke's, he was able to identify the same word independently from the same scroll and has since produced this incredible image, clearly showing four and a half columns of text separated by margins. This hasn't been fully decoded yet, but it shows that decoding these scrolls completely is actually within our reach. What's more is this technology is going to be in serious demand because we actually haven't found the main library of the Villa of the Papyri yet, which means that there's a high probability that far more than 1,000 scrolls lay waiting to be discovered within its ruins. I included this one because I think it's just a great example of how technology is changing archaeology. Using particles to 3D scan ancient burnt up scrolls and then use machines to read what they said is something that only existed in sci-fi movies not even 10 or even 5 years ago, and yet here we are. I think this is such a great example of how rather than being afraid of technologies like machine learning and AI that could forever change the job market, we should look to how it can make our jobs better, how it can do things that we never dreamed of, and how we can adapt and manipulate new technologies to suit archaeological excavations. Number five is a personal favorite of mine. This is the earliest carpentry ever found. A 500,000 year old wooden structure discovered in Zambia has completely changed our perceptions of ancient people's abilities and what they were doing almost half a million years ago. The previous record for the oldest wooden structure was just 9,000 years old and was definitely made by Homo sapiens, which is us. But this newly discovered structure goes back half a million years to a time before anatomically modern humans even existed. Because we didn't exist at the time, the most likely candidate is Homo heidelbergensis, which is known to have inhabited this area at the time. The discovery is a pair of interlocking logs joined together by an intentionally cut notch that was made using stone tools and you can see these very deliberate cut marks all over the wood in these images. The researchers believe that because it was found on the banks of Colambo Falls that it may have formed a walkway or platform to keep people up out of the water. A small collection of wooden tools including a wedge and a digging stick were also discovered at the site. All of the previous evidence surrounding Homo heidelbergensis has indicated that they were an extremely mobile species with limited technological capabilities. However, this discovery completely changes that perception. It shows that Heidelbergensis had a high level of abstract thinking, that they were able to plan ahead, visualize what they were trying to make, and then execute the steps required to achieve that goal. It shows that Heidelbergensis was most likely not the nomadic species that we previously thought, suggesting there could possibly be more permanent wooden structures out there waiting to be discovered. Preservation is going to be a huge barrier because wood definitely doesn't normally preserve this long, but it shows that this is still a possibility. One of the more intriguing parts of this discovery is that the logs themselves are quite large, measuring 1.5 and 1 meter or 5 and 3.2 feet long, and while a single person could theoretically cut them down and move them there on their own, it's far more likely that this was done by a group, which suggests some form of communication, maybe even language, which is something that we've never had reason to believe that Heidelbergensis was capable of before. I included this one because I personally love useware and I don't get to see it on wood too much, but also because it completely changes our perception of Heidelbergensis. Are there whole villages of wooden structures out there waiting to be found that were made by Heidelbergensis, or have they all been completely lost to time? Of course, two logs does not make a village, but it does hint at the possibility, and that's what's so exciting. Keeping with the theme of ancient human ancestors, number six takes us to the oldest ever Neanderthal engravings. Assigning art to a specific species of human ancestor during the time periods when we intersected with each other is incredibly difficult. Who's to say who made paintings inside a cave 55,000 years ago when there's evidence that both Neanderthals and Homo sapiens inhabited the cave at the same time or during alternating periods? Without the ability to date rock art and petroglyphs, this is one of archaeology's greatest and most endearing challenges. 
But even with the ability to date rock art, it wouldn't be a silver bullet to the problem either. Dates always have a range. For example, when you see a date that says something is 50,000 years old, the actual date range is more likely to be something like 45,000 to 55,000 years old. We just use the median date because that's as accurate as we can be. Still, if we could do this for rock art, it would be completely useless in determining which species painted which rock in instances where there's overlap in habitation by different species. That's why this find is so important. 240 kilometers southwest of Paris is a place called La Roche Cotard Cave that until its discovery in 1846 by construction workers had been completely sealed off from the outside world for more than 57,000 years. This incredible time capsule comprises four main chambers. The Mousterian Gallery named for the Mousterian stone tools discovered here, the Lemmings Chamber, the Pillar Chamber, and finally the Hyena Chamber. Unfortunately, the ceiling has collapsed in the back of the Hyena Chamber, and so it is unknown how far back the cave actually goes. It is here, in this cave, that archaeologists believe they've identified the oldest engravings ever attributed to Neanderthals. What they've identified is something called finger flutes. Now, if you imagine a pattern created by separating your fingers and dragging them through the sand, that's what they look like, except these are carvings. There are eight panels with a total of 433 carvings that the paper paper refers to as anthropogenic traces. That means that these were made by humans but are not all necessarily pieces of art. The carvings vary in pattern from the finger flutes to dots, lines following the contours of the caves and circles and ovals. There is also a progression in art style from the entrance panels that gradually change to a different style the deeper into the cave you go. The team also identified that the carvings were made using bare hands rather than tools. They did this by creating similar art at a different site with bone, wood, antler, flint and even metal tools and then created 3D models of the carving lines for comparison to the real ones. They determined with this method that the only markings that matched those in the caves was the ones done by bare hands. Okay, so it's just some lines in a cave that somebody did with their hands. Why is this such a big deal? Well, the team has dated these to 57,000 years ago and argued that this is the earliest and first unambiguous date for Neanderthal carvings ever found. They argue that because the cave was sealed 57,000 years ago and the vast majority of our current evidence says that Homo sapiens wasn't present in the area until 54,000 years ago, that these could only have been done by Neanderthals. This is also the first time finger tracings like this have been associated with a species other than Homo sapiens. But whether these carvings are truly symbolic art is still up for debate. Because of how easily these lines can be created in the soft limestone, some have argued that this is no more symbolic than dragging your hands through the sand. And the distinction is quite important, because simply making something and making something symbolic and representative of something else is a dramatically different step in terms of cognitive ability. Unfortunately, we don't have any definitive evidence for whether these carvings are symbolic, but this is still incredible research, and in my personal opinion, further evidence that Neanderthals were far more intelligent and sophisticated than most people typically think them to have been. Number 7 brings us to the viral video section, and first up is this incredibly well-preserved 3,000-year-old sword discovered in Bavaria in Germany. The original video I made for this is sitting at 3.2 million views, and it attracted a lot of disbelief that it could possibly even be real. Lots of people in the comments even accused the archaeologists of planting it to improve their careers. While it is a funny accusation and mostly hyperbole about how well preserved the sword is, I just want to point out that this is virtually impossible. The number of people on an archaeological dig would make planting something incredibly difficult because the sediments surrounding the artifact would be disturbed during the planting and virtually everybody would notice immediately. Unless they're all in on it except they aren't because we can see the undisturbed sediments surrounding the sword. As for the preservation, all that's required is that oxygen does not get to the sword. Many sediments are capable of creating these types of environments, such as the ones that preserved the half a million year old wooden logs. If you want to see how incredibly effective natural preservation can be, I highly recommend checking out the bog bodies. Some of them are 2000 years old and even have beard stubble on their faces. Anyway, when I first saw this, I was absolutely awestruck by the preservation and beautiful craftsmanship of this sword. The intricate decoration on the handle, the gorgeous and functional ornate rivets holding it together, and even the way the handle melds into the blade is just incredible to behold. This 3,000-year-old beauty dates to the Bronze Age and was found in a burial alongside a man, woman, and child, which appear to have been buried together at the same time. Testing is still to be conducted as to whether these people were related, but it was assumed that they are a family. Interestingly, the sword shows no visible signs of ever being used. 
There are no scuff or cut marks anywhere along the blade or handle, which may indicate that this was a ceremonial or symbolic blade, but according to the team, its center of gravity towards the front of the sword indicates that it was actually designed to be an effective slashing weapon. To me, this seems to hint at the possibility that it was made to be used in combat shortly before the bearer's death, and they just simply didn't get time to use it. Otherwise, why go to all the trouble to create such a balanced weapon? This also possibly indicates that the family buried together died unexpectedly in some sort of accident or died together for some other reason such as disease. Now the hilt of the blade is actually a clue as to where this was made. It's what's called an octagonal hilt, which refers to the way the hilt is divided into eight facets. These types of swords were made using a technique called overlay casting, where the handle was actually cast over the top of the blade and sealed with two rivets. Because of this, the only two known manufacturing areas that could have made this sword were either southern Germany, near to where the sword was found, or Denmark. Unfortunately, that is the only data we have on this find at the moment, and when we do get more, I will provide you guys with an update on my socials. Number eight, and next up in the viral video list, we have these incredible antler artifacts from the end of the last Ice Age that racked up 1.6 million views on TikTok. Archaeologists from the University of Chester discovered a hunter-gatherer settlement dating to the end of the last Ice Age in Scarborough, England, in part of the very famous Starcar site. If you're unfamiliar with Starcar, it is considered the most important Mesolithic site in Britain because of the incredible amount of information it has provided. The reason for such incredible preservation at Starcar is that this area was once a lake that was filled in by waterlogged peat, which prevented organic material from oxidizing and decaying. For example, there have been 195 barbed points made from red deer stag antlers recovered from Starcar, and that sample makes up 95% of the entire British Mesolithic total. Other incredible finds at this site include 21 of these red deer stag skulls which have been drilled and shaped in a way that suggests they were worn on people's heads. The site is also home to the oldest houses in Britain at 11,500 years old, as well as a wooden platform near the lake's edge that was covered in moss and is the oldest example of carpentry. Well, until recently. As if that wasn't enough, the oldest known Mesolithic art also comes from Starcar and is known very creatively as the Starcar Pendant. If you're interested in learning more about Starcar, it was actually featured in Season 10, Episode 5 of Digging for Britain. Anyway, let's get back to the find. What's so incredible about this is that it dates to 12,500 years ago. This was a time before metal and pottery had made its way to Britain, which means that hunter tools were entirely made from wood and antlers and other organic material. Because these types of tools typically don't preserve very well, we don't know as much about this time period as we do about the Stone Age and the Metal Ages, which makes this just an absolute treasure trove of potential information about these ancient people. You can see that this antler point was likely used as a barb for fishing, indicating that they probably were familiar and proficient with exploiting and living in wet and coastal environments. This next antler point has carvings along the margins, which might simply just be decorations, it might be a way to identify this person's tool among others, perhaps it's to track the number of kills, or maybe it's just simply doodling during downtime. It also suggests long-term use of tools rather than expedient production. For example, if you're using a type of wooden spear that you know is prone to breaking, it seems logical that you'd be less likely to spend time decorating it as opposed to a sturdier, long-lasting spear. I also think that despite a lot of popular media still depicting hunter-gatherers as constantly on the verge of starving, this decorative practice is a strong indicator of leisure time, something that you probably wouldn't have if you were constantly searching for your next meal. Inside the pit where this was discovered, there are also a bunch of animal bones, including elk, red deer, beavers and water birds that were butchered and their bones and antlers turned into weapons and tools. Interestingly, many of the weapons and tools appear to have been dismantled and then placed alongside the bones in the wetlands, which the team suggests may be indicative of rules surrounding the handling of animal remains. These kinds of finds are so, so important because we have just so few of them and organic tools and materials would have made up a huge part of material culture during these times. For the most part, there is very little record of it and so this is a really important find. I would absolutely die to find something like this in Australia where we have even less in terms of organic tools preserved in the archaeological record because we just have really acidic soils. Okay, number nine, here's one for all the weebs out there. Archaeologists in Japan have found a sword so large that it could only have come from the Demon Slayer anime. 
This is my second most popular YouTube short with a combined total of 4.5 million views, but unfortunately it is also the one we know the least about. At the Tomiomaru Yuma Burial Mound in Nara City, Japan, archaeologists discovered a burial containing a 2.3 meter long sword and a 63 by 31 centimeter bronze mirror. Both of these are the largest ever found in Japan, and the mound has been dated to between 300 and 538 CE. This period is a time known as the Kofun period, and based on the markings around the mirror, archaeologists are confident that the sword and mirror also fall within this range. Now mirrors for this period are typically round shaped, but this one is in the shape of a shield. Because it was found alongside the sword, it has led to some pretty interesting comments about fighting Medusa and other demonic spirits in the comments of these videos, which I absolutely love the idea of. Imagine what an incredible story that would be. As for the sword itself, it has a slight bend over its 2.3 meter length, which is typical of a type of sword called a Darkoken. Darkokens are related to the worship of a snake god, which I believe is Ryujin, but I wasn't able to confirm if that was the case for this specific Kofun period. Anyway, because of its size, which would make it impossible to actually wield in combat unless you were a biblical giant, as some people have claimed, archaeologists believe that this was likely a decorative or ceremonial sword used for festivals or temple worship. We also know that the scabbard is made of wood and that the Pommel, scabbard, and scabbard butt are lacquered with a pigment dyed red using cinnabar and mercury. Now the researchers also found a square wooden coffin that the team says is associated with the mirror and the sword, but at the time I made the original video they were yet to open the coffin and didn't provide any more details so it's time for an update. Just kidding, this is archaeology. A year isn't anywhere near long enough for us to have any new information so I guess I'll make another video about this when we do finally hear something. Number 10 brings us to the secret of self-healing Roman concrete. This video has over 14 million views just on my TikTok. In total, it's got over 40 million views with people who have reposted it and whatnot. And this was by far the most successful video I've ever done. So everybody who checked that out and followed me because of it, thank you very much. In fact, I even got recognized in somebody else's Twitch chat as the Roman concrete guy. So that was interesting. When I first heard about Roman concrete as a kid, I was confused as to why it was so different. Why could nobody figure out how this worked? Worked. Why were things that were built 2000 years ago so incredibly new looking? And it turns out a lot of people had this same thought, but that wasn't even the most impressive part. You see, when Roman concrete cracks, it has the ability to heal those cracks and strengthen itself completely on its own. It's as if it's some sort of living regenerative being. When I was old enough to do some research and look into this, I discovered that actually nobody had a goddamn clue how this worked, and that was extremely frustrating. But now, thanks to science and these researchers, we actually have sort of an answer. The ingredients, including the volcanic ash, are important. People have always said this, but the smoking gun that led the team to figure this out was actually the small white chunks of limestone that stood out in the concrete because everything else was extremely well mixed. If you're trying to visualize it, imagine a cake that's absolutely beautiful and then you bite into it and there's huge chunks of uncooked flour. It just seemed weird and maybe intentional. Where other researchers had assumed that this was simply the result of poor mixing, these researchers understood that the Romans were meticulous about all aspects of Roman concrete making and figured that this had to have been by design. So the team took 10 samples of Roman concrete from the city wall of Privernum, which is an archaeological site near Rome. Then they fired a scanning electron microscope with an attachment called an energy dispersive spectroscopy. This basically blasts the sample with electrons, which causes x-rays to fly off that can then be measured to determine the sample chemical composition. This experiment showed that the particular lime reaction that occurs in Roman concrete can only occur if the concrete is mixed at extremely high temperatures, which adds a bunch of chemical reactions to the mix and is caused by the limestone itself. Because the lime chunks are the largest particles in the concrete mix and have the highest surface area, the team also noticed that cracks almost always formed where these particles were. This exposed the lime within the concrete to the elements and when water flowed over the cracks during rain or flood, the lime reacted with the water to form a hard calcium carbonate which essentially glued the crack back together and prevented it from spreading. What the team had identified was the process that allowed Roman concrete to turn its biggest weakness into its greatest strength. While the concrete was weak because of the large blocks of lime that were inside of the mix, that same lime that caused the weakness also allowed it to repair itself and become stronger than it was before. I'm sure there's a philosophical tale about turning strengths into weaknesses here somewhere that I just can't reach for, but uh, yeah, that's the secret. Turns out that was the secret all along. The team was able to replicate this in the lab and identify exactly how it works. 
that's it for the countdown, guys. I do want to add three more points, though. These are points that I personally think are important, but are maybe not as sexy as the other ones. So I don't have a script for this part, so I'm just going to tell you guys about it, and we can talk about it on my socials or in the comments. So make sure you leave one. Off the northwest coast of a place called Murijuga, whose colonial name is Dampier or Karatha, archaeologists have found a site that includes stone tools submerged beneath the waves. This is something that archaeologists in Australia have known was coming for a very long time, but it hasn't been found until now. You see, at the end of the last ice age, Australia was approximately one third bigger. When the ice caps melted, that sea level rushed in and it essentially buried the oldest and most significant sites that Australia would ever have underwater. These are the sites that would give us the actual oldest dates for people coming to Australia. They are all underwater now. They're buried by the ocean. And so this is the first step towards being able to investigate those while it's, you know, it's only in a few meters. It's not even a meter, I think, of water. It's still a huge step towards the, the end goal of being able to find those sites that are the first sites of people coming to Australia. The next one that I think is really important is new genetic evidence that indicates about a million years ago we almost went extinct. So sometime between eight and 900,000 years ago there was a severe and dramatic reduction in genetic diversity that can only be explained by the loss of like 98% of the breeding population. So what this means in practicality is that for 120,000 years there was only about 1,200 human ancestors on the entire planet. Other research also supports this, such as the emergence of chromosome 2 around 900,000 years ago, as well as the divergence of the last common ancestors shared by humans and Neanderthals and Denisovans around the same time. This is such an incredible discovery because it shows that we have the power to peer back into the past really far with DNA, but it also gives us information about how exactly our genetics formed, and this will help us determine you know, a, a whole lot of things about who we are genetically. Okay, last point I want to make. Do you guys remember the footprints that were found in New Mexico that were 23,000 years old? Well, there's been some pretty heated debate about the dating techniques used for the original study. The team used aquatic seeds that absorb carbon differently, and many people argued that the dates were wrong because of this. Well, the same team has actually gone back and done optically stimulated luminescence as well as pollen dating to date the footprints, and guess what? Same date, 23,000 years ago. People were in the Americas 23,000 years ago. Debate settled, right? Not exactly. Because this is such a monumental discovery and we really need to get this right, potential flaws in the new dates have been pointed out. But still, we have three dating techniques that all converge on the same time period, all saying 23,000 years old. So this is really significant. I think we can start to accept that this is people were there 23,000 years ago. I don't personally think that there's anything wrong with accepting this as fact now. That's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for checking out. Whether you're listening on the podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, I appreciate you guys, everybody who checks out my socials. If you haven't done that and you've somehow found me on YouTube or the podcast independently, please check me out. I'm Liminality TV. You can find me in the comments description. There'll be links for my Instagram, my YouTube, my TikTok. The podcast is also there. If you found it, it's called Unearthing History. It's on all the platforms. I also stream on Twitch three to four times a week. I am trying to do content as much as I can this year. I would like to one day become a full-time content creator. So if you did enjoy the content, please consider supporting me by liking, sharing, commenting, doing all the things. And that's it for today. I will see you on the next episode.